everyone. I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals, and I want to welcome you to the 2021 AFI Docs Industry Forum and to this session, Breaking the Silence, How Documentaries Can Shape Conversations on Racial Violence. First, I want to thank our sponsor of the forum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I also want to thank our AFI members and, of course, you, our audience. Finally, I wanna thank our moderator and all of our panelists for participating today. Please note that if you have questions, please include those in the chat and we will feed those to the moderator for our Q&A at the end. So let me introduce our moderator and panelists for today. Today's moderator, Sherry Simpson, is Senior Director, Engagement and Impact Innovation at ITVS. She's joined by our great panelists, Jacqueline Olive, the director producer of the film Always in Season, which we were honored to screen at AFI Docs 2019. Katie Borum Chatu, executive director, Center for Media and Social Impact. David Conrad Perez, research director, Center for Media and Social Impact. And Vanessa Jackson and Lisa Flick Wilson of the Radical Optimist Collective. I also want to uh, thank uh, our uh, ASL interpreter for today, Shannon Rickert, um, for her services. With that, uh, thanks everybody. And I am going to toss it to you, Sherry, take it away. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you so much, everyone. We are delighted to be here to share this panel um, with you. And really we consider it a conversation, one that actually started a couple of years ago. Um, and in fact, just a little sidebar, it actually started in some ways at AFI. I think the first time I met with Katie Wormshatu and David Conrad Perez, we actually met um, in the hallowed halls of AFI docs um, over two years ago to discuss the possibilities for this study. So it's perfect that we're back today to discuss what happened um, with this groundbreaking study. And I'm just delighted that we have all of the people who have been part of it. So why is it important? We're gonna get to all of that. Um, but I wanna just start by saying that the way that we're going to um, conduct this panel today, it's really a conversation with you. And it's very important to us that we hear right off the bat what you're thinking. Um, we'd like to invite you now to include any thoughts that you may have around engagement and impact, anything that may be on your mind in the chat, as well as your name, and if you choose to where you're from. Uh, I'm coming to you today from Atlanta, Georgia, which is the original uh, lands of the Muscogee and the Cherokee tribes, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you from wherever you are today. Um, we're going to really talk about this study, which again is the same as the title for our panel, Breaking the Silence, How Documentaries Can Shape the Conversation on Racial Violence in America and Create New Communities. So that is a very powerful statement, and we're going to be talking a lot about the power of language in this conversation. I don't want to lose sight of the power of those words as we go forward. Um, what we do need to all kind of rally around now is just that the study um, was actually based on the film Always in Season. Um, the brilliant, and I dare say there are so many other ways to describe it, but brilliant film um, by Jackie Olive that won um, Sundance in 2018, a, a special jury prize for moral urgency. And dare I say that in many ways, the urgency has only increased in the time in which that film premiered. And we're delighted that she is with us today. Uh, so we're gonna begin um, really with a clip from Always in Season, again, the basis for this study, and then we'll come back and begin our conversation. Um, so uh, please let's cut to the clip of Always in Season. Thank you so much. If you knew in your heart and in your mind that someone took your child's life, how far would you go to get to the truth? There's a male subject hanging from the swing. It's a black male subject. I think they hung him up to make it look like a suicide. It looked like a back in the day lynching. His body would be hung in the courthouse square for all to see. All white folks are invited to the party. Lynching was a message crime. They happened in places where the body would be seen. And it's the public nature of lynching that really condemns the white community. Because the idea that people didn't know, they did know. As 
As I started researching black males committing suicide in public over the last few years, I became quite concerned that there may be a bigger surreptitious movement at play here. The caption, last night picked before the game. That does not sound like a person that was planning on killing himself. Any injustice affects everybody that's around it. So we don't want anything in the dark. Bring it to the light. Well, um, thank you so much for viewing the trailer with me. And it really does set the stage for what we want to talk about, um, given that this film digs deeply into um, the legacy of um, racial injustice, but also of lynching itself. And I wanna really just invite Jacqueline Olive uh, to join me now in a conversation that really is, all begins with you, Jackie, and your vision for Always in Season. Would you just share with us the genesis of the film? And then we're gonna talk a little more about its role in the study. Thank you. Just unmuted myself. Thank you, Sherry. I, I appreciate the very generous introduction. Um, and I wanted to say before I begin that my pronouns are um, she and her. And I am in central, on the central coast of California, and what's rightfully also known as Ohlone land. Um, and so, um, as you mentioned, Always in Season um, really digs deep into the history of uh, racial violence and lynching specifically. But the film is really rooted in the story of a um, a 17 year old named Lynn, Lynn and Lacey who was found hanging from a swing set in 2014 in Bladenboro, North Carolina. And I spent 10 years making the film and, and really had um, uh, the wonderful privilege of working with a, an amazing crew um, on the project. Um, but I spent uh, probably two years researching and developing the project, um, the, looking at the subject of lynching and trying to understand fully the scope of the terrorism. And so it took me about two years to really feel like I had wrapped my head around the subject enough um, to be able to take a deep dive into production. And once I found that there were people on the ground doing um, work around justice and reconciliation, I realized that that was my end to the story and filmed all around the country in eight cities for about eight years, um, looking at what people were doing, like the reenactors um, who were in the film, who, are, who reenact quadruple lynching that happened there in 1946, looking at what they were doing to make sure that the victims were never forgotten and to bring the perpetrators um, to justice. Um, and so just about the time that I felt like uh, I was ready to wrap, I learned about uh, Lennon's death and then um, reached out to the family there and filmed with Claudia as she fought to get an FBI investigation opened into the case um, and moved actually to North Carolina to be closer to filming about an hour away from Bladenboro because I, I wanted to, I understood by that time um, the complications of the narrative. And I also saw the similarities between what was going on, what Claudia was facing and other people in Bladenboro, the similarities with what communities had faced um, who were dealing with historical lynchings, um, those the questions of what happened um, being left with because of the investigations weren't necessarily thorough being left with uh, stories and speculation and really um, uh, not enough answers about what happened in communities all across the country. Well, um, again and again, thank you for this film. Um, you know, it's, it, even when I see the trailer, it just really opens up so much. And I'm sure that folks who are um, in our audience today may have thoughts about it. And I just want to encourage, again, this is a conversation, um, a very powerful one. And we do want to invite, if you have thoughts about anything that's being discussed, to please, we will have 15 to 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. And um, we encourage your thoughts and comments, as well as questions in the chat. Um, you know, Jackie, thank you for that. And I'll just say that what I'm struck by in hearing your description of the production process is that engagement for so many people, we tend to think of it at the end of a film, when the film is coming out, having audiences see films. And really, it sounds like your engagement began with just, in fact, placing yourself in this, in the environment, in this town, um, in the area, and really becoming a part um, living alongside of the story as it unfolded. So I do want to mark that as an extraordinary aspect of engagement and one that we're going to pick up on in our conversation around this study. And in fact, what is so groundbreaking about it, and you'll be able to make that determination for yourself, I like to say it is because it actually, always in season, along with this study, sparked an entire new area at ITVS, um, where funders and presenters, of course, of Independent Lens and other um, 
uh, nonfiction films on PBS nonfiction uh, strands. But the reality is that for us, as long as we've been doing this work a couple of decades, um, it changed things. The study changed things for us. I'll get more into that. So with no further ado, I do want to introduce um, two of our other panelists, esteemed panelists, Katie Borm-Chatou um, and David Conrad Perez, who were the con really conceived of this study. And I'd like to invite them to share now the genesis of the study. And Katie, if we could start with you as the executive director of the Center for Media and Social Impact, and David will go over to you to describe your process. So Katie, how did this all get started? And could you just talk about Always in Season as well, link us to from the film to the ground and your vision for the study. Sure, um, thank you. It's a real honor to be with everyone. I wish we were in person. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I am sitting on the ancestral homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway Kunoi people in the DC area. And um, yeah, I, I wanna talk briefly and then mostly hand it over to my colleague, uh, David, who did so much work physically on the ground in this study, which is part of what we found so meaningful and special about it. But um, for the, I'll just briefly say a few things to kind of set us up. So for those in the audience that don't know about the Center for Media and Social Impact, we are a longstanding, what we call innovation lab and research center that studies, showcases, and creates media for social justice and social change. And so I like to call us the critical utopians. Uh, there are a lot of people that study and look at and want to talk about how media is destructive. And that certainly is true in a lot of cases, but we're the organization that likes to really look for ways that um, really deeply authentic storytelling is so meaningful culturally when we think about how we shape our understanding of one another with communities that we don't know, for communities that we do know that have been pathologized or marginalized, et cetera. And so out of that work, we, we have a, a strong practice in documentary um, for lots of different reasons. Um, I myself am a documentary producer. The center was uh, going on before I took over the leadership position, but briefly, and how it connects to Jackie's beautiful film and this study. We've known almost since the evolution of the documentary form at the early part of the last century that documentaries are meaningful in communities because of how they physically gather people. Um, documentaries were always used that way, including the sort of real heyday of the Verite movement when it picked up in the 50s and 60s and 70s was because people had lighter film gear and they could go into these intimate spaces and be with people and communities for long periods of time and to tell their own stories. So a really empowering way to think about the meaning of docs. Um, and the other thing it's important to acknowledge is that sometimes in this country, this is a really gross understatement, we politicize things that are about basic human rights and violence and dignity. And documentaries often, particularly the kind that Jackie makes uh, and many of the films that screen at AFI docs, actually cut through that kind of easy, lazy way out of saying this is about ideological identification, this is all about how we vote. Uh, when documentaries are able to tell us about the human condition and we all can connect at some, some level, this is the most basic part of being human, is that we should be able to connect with our fellow human beings in times of triumph and great suffering uh, and to sort of cut through that politicism. You all know what I'm saying. Um, so just briefly to set up this film, you know, we've done a lot of work, lots of different methodological approaches that look at how documentaries make social impact. We do quantitative studies, qualitative studies. Um, when we knew that Always in Season was the film that would be the centerpiece of this study, uh, we knew that gathering people in physical spaces that are ideologically and politically mixed, i.e. not preaching to the choir, not a uniform group of people. We had a very strong hunch based on our work that this documentary was going to be meaningful for many different reasons, but one of which was because the, of the conversation that it naturally generates, which is not necessarily a partisan conversation, but it's one about humans and communities coming together. Um, 
And another thing that we really wanted to explore, and this is, David will explain this, and then um, our wonderful partners at Radical Optimist Collective, Lisa and Vanessa will also explain this because they are really superheroes in this area. But we also know, we also thought that for this documentary, holding space for conversation was not necessarily going to be about showing the film and then a panel of people just talking, that you had to hold the space and physically create the space quite differently. And again, this is where Lisa and Vanessa are true experts and um, agreed to work with us um, to join in this study. And so let me stop talking just to set that up and hand it over to David, who was physically on the ground in all these communities. I really want to lift that up because it was at the time I mean, just to add a, a note of drama, we were literally one week away from the world shutting down from the pandemic and David Conrad Perez was out in America doing this study and we're so grateful to him for being able to do that. So I, I, I wanted to lift that up specifically. So David, I'm gonna hand it to you. I probably talked Great. too long as usual, sorry. No, thank you, that was very helpful. Um, thank you so much, Katie. And no, it was the perfect way into this, I think. Um, and hi everyone, I'm David. My Pronouns are he and him, and I'm the research director at CMSI. And I guess I'm, I wanna start by echoing everything that Katie said at the opening. I'm grateful and excited for this opportunity to, to share the study with you today. And it's always a privilege to see and um, especially collaborate with the other people on this panel, Sherry, Jacqueline, uh, Vanessa, Lisa, everybody. So thank you to Ken and all the organizers of this at, at AFI. I've been looking forward to it. Um, and I have some slides, I think, they might be up, or if, if not, I can talk through them, or maybe I'm just not seeing them yet. Um, but, um, but I'll talk through as if they're there. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, as Katie said, with this study, we wanted to learn how Always in Season would be received um, in a diverse set of communities, you know, whether it would be trusted, um, or how it would be trusted, what kind of conversations it would start. And so we conducted um, focus groups and surveys across the country to explore this. And um, I'll be sharing, of course, what we discovered, but um, first I wanna quickly summarize the method we used to get there. So you can have a sense of the rigor that went into this work so you can trust the results. And because in the end, you know, while our aim was for the study to help inform and support more studies and more investments and more work in this space, um, we also hope that the engagement model that we produced um, will be of practical use um, to filmmakers right now. Um, and so I want to share some of those introductory details on it today in case it might be helpful to someone in their work right now. Um, so to begin with the method, if we could maybe just skip ahead a couple more slides. I think Katie covered this. Perfect, this is great. Um, so instead of following you know, the traditional academic model of research through which you develop this set of questions, often the bubble of your university, and then you move into the data collection process. Um, as Katie was saying, we kind of started by stepping sideways. Um, so we started by expanding the research team. So we consulted um, organizations that had worked, had a tradition of using documentaries to facilitate community and dialogue around, um, around documentaries, including working films and others. And we uh, connected with experts who had experience working with some of the issues underscoring the film. So including racial violence and healing. Um, this meant visiting and engaging with the Radical Optimist Collective team um, who will join us here shortly. And we started by discussing the objectives of the research, some of the early drafts of the research questions. And then uh, we basically built a documentary centered model of engagement with them for this work. And so we were able to have this dual kind of purpose method that allowed us to answer and explore the questions of the research while also providing a tool that filmmakers could use afterwards. Um, and we're working on an article that, that spells out some of the precise steps of the method in detail. Um, and we also have some, um, we also have, you know, the report and a resource guide that we can share as well. But I want to just highlight a couple of the grounding features here so you can have a sense of um, basically of how it works. So first, uh, in every community, we identified a local co-facilitator. So someone who could ground the study locally um, and help it be responsive to the community or the place where the documentary would be screened. So we could anticipate, for instance, um, whether anything similar had happened in the community recently that might come up, um, which unfortunately was often the case. Um, and second, we started every conversation with an open question um, where we asked every participant to simply describe how they felt after watching the documentary. Um, and from there, the questions focused on exploring the people, decisions, and events in the documentary, which still kept the gravity of the conversation at a distance. 
um, to then exploring and confronting the realities of racial violence and racism within their own communities, which meant confronting the truths um, within not only their neighborhood, but the room we were in. Um, and so it, it tended to go from this natural progression of the personal to the documentary to the wider community. Um, and so these are just you know a couple features of the method, but the point here is that it wasn't uh, rocket science. Um, it was purposeful um, and it was evidence-based, um, but it was also supposed to be clear and, and replicable. Um, and so uh, hopefully some of this stuff will become clear too in some of the items that we, we can share and guidance materials too for anybody that's interested. Um, and next slide. So for the, right, for the communities that we visited, we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to the typical, you know, film festival audience, uh, no offense. Um, and so we selected seven communities that reflected a, a diverse cross section of the country. So as a reminder, as Katie said, you know, this uh, study was conducted in February of 2020, um, which was a moment uh, of unprecedented media distrust. Um, and so we also wanted to try and use that moment to our advantage um, and to explore whether the, the film would be able to cut through the noise at that time as a trusted source of information. So we selected screenings and counties that reflected uh, uh, geographic and demographic diversity, um, political partisanship diversity, uh, media diversity. So we looked to include counties that were in or adjacent to local news deserts, in addition to those that were in major cities um, and economic diversity. And so uh, next slide, please. So to move to the findings or the, the so what of all this, we have um, seven key takeaways that I'll just briefly introduce um, right now. Uh, first, we found that documentaries are uniquely capable of cutting through a climate of media mistrust. Um, and we, were, we learned that people felt as though the doc, um, always in season, was reporting on an important story that local and national media were overlooking. So in every community, um, participants shared the belief that local and national media outlets were failing them and that truths were being hidden from them, especially when it came to issues of racial violence and injustice. Um, they expressed a range of emotions uh, from sadness and shame to outrage and frustration at not knowing more about cases of racial violence in particular across the country um, and a feeling that they're missing other critical stories that are important to them in their community. Um, participants also widely described the, the documentaries providing a longer story than they get from the news and providing details that they believe to be true. So in an anonymous survey um, that we gave to, um, to over 200 participants following the screenings, we found that 99% of them, so all but one, uh, respondents said that they thought the documentary provided a true portrayal of a real problem, um, which is quite remarkable given the, the time that the study was based. Um, and next slide, please, thank you. Uh, third, we found that documentaries are making news personal um, and helping people make meaning from the news. And so they can be effective tools for community building. So both of these points are discussed more in the report um, and they connect with how documentaries are um, uh, uniquely capable of transporting people into narratives um, and that can help them experience or confront an issue in such a way that it's hard for them to come back to that same issue in the same way again afterwards. Um, and this is something that, that Katie has written a lot about and I'm sure could, could speak to in the Q&A too um, um, if there's any questions related to that. But just to share a couple of quick additional notes on community building. Um, first, we really can't understate the importance that participants placed on the community or public nature of these screenings, um, that watching a documentary about racial violence with other members of their community in person and at a public space uh, was, was meaningful. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss this more in the Q&A too, if there's interest. Uh, finally, people in every community emphasized a desire to feel heard on the problem of racial violence first and its true history before moving to discussions of solutions. Um, and so Always in Season provided an ideal starting point for that to happen because they trusted the details and the history that it told. So it provided that point of shared understanding, um, a common reference point for us to start. Um, and the final slide. And so finally, we documented the, the many ways that, um, simply put, documentary-driven community conversations are not the same as panel events. Um, and so this finding is, is rather simple and it may even seem obvious, but it was an important one to many of the study's participants, uh, especially, um, uh, so essentially that instead of deferring to experts, um, we found that designing conversations around experience sharing where everyone in the room is considered an expert on their own experience was important. Um, and we spoke to several people who expressed frustration, um, even pain at the typical panel discussion, including some of those that, that followed the, the screenings that we visited. 
where people would go through an emotional experience only to then need to defer to a panel of often academics who explained to them what was important. Um, and so while the, the panel might be an effective educational strategy in providing helpful context um, to a problem to follow a documentary, it probably shouldn't be considered as an engagement strategy. Um, the participants uh, definitely emphasized in every place. Um, finally, affirmations of support are not enough. Um, community building necessitates action. Um, and so I think because I'm coming up on time, this is part of a, a bigger point in the study. But just to say that while the, the conversations were helpful, participants said that follow-up action is essential and that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of identifying ways that, that these conversations can be sustained so that people and organizations in the room um, can be held accountable for the promises they make to each other. And so for these community screenings to be seen as the start of something bigger and not just the, the last step of a film's dissemination strategy, um, a point that I think Sherry kind of lifted at the very beginning of this. And so to close, um, you know, we argue that all of this connects with the importance of training, um, putting time into identifying good facilitators and not just outsourcing the work to subject matter experts or panels, um, providing more resources and support to doing community engagement work, especially around um, important, important documentaries like Always in Season, um, which is something we hope the study will support. And in learning from people like Sherry at ITVS, Elisa and Vanessa of VAT Radical Optimist, who I believe are next on this panel, um, and from the work that Jackie and her team did in their community screenings, and who all bring the type of experience that this kind of work requires and that we think filmmakers could really benefit from. So uh, I think I'll stop here, but happy to speak, of course, more um, on any of this during the panel or afterward with anyone who might be interested. Thank you, David. That is um, really awesome. And I just want to underscore um, for our audience now as well, please feel free again to add to the chat and we're going to be collecting thoughts and we'll be addressing them shortly. Um, so please do stand by. Um, David, you've really provided us with a perfect um, report on what took place out there. And I just want to um, lean in just for this moment um, to both Lisa Flick Wilson and Vanessa Jackson, who are in fact radical optimists who did work with the team at CMSI on the ground, David, Katie, and all of us to make this happen. And so let me just um, paint a little bit of a picture and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, North Carolina, I'm gonna just say North Carolina. Jackie has already, already mentioned that she uh, moved there to be there on site um, where the story was unfolding for Always in Season. And we linked back to that community to host um, one of our focus groups. And so for the sake of our audience, mainly filmmakers, I'm guessing, and certainly the coalition of the willing and the, those who understand the power of storytelling. What happens in a room where, you know, racial healing is really on the surface? How did we get there? How did you make this focus group um, really the experience that David has so poignantly shared? Um, and I'd love for you to just start with um, just saying a little bit about radical optimists, but in the time we have, I'd love for you to take us into that room. Um, yes. So over to you, Lisa and Vanessa. Sure. So I'll just um, say a bit about Radical Octopus and I'll have Vanessa bring us into the room in Durham. Um, so we're a collective of women who works uh, both national, but really our origin stories out of Montgomery, Alabama, where we created experiences and support for folks that were experiencing the Legacy Museum and Memorial, um, a traumatizing, a brilliant, but traumatizing experience uh, for those of you watching um, who have been there. If you haven't, we would welcome you to come. Um, so we knew what it meant to hold space and create space for pain and possibility, which is where our name comes from. That's the radical part of the optimist part. Um, and so what I, I want to also just give um, a shout out to, I think, David and Katie, who from the beginning knew that they were doing something different. They knew that I mean, honestly, we're using the word focus group in this conversation. It was not a focus group at all. Um, it wasn't about extracting information. It wasn't about getting to some end outcome that was already predetermined. I love what Jackie said in the beginning about how she <laughs> changed her life to become more proximate to um, people that whose stories she was holding. And so all of those pieces kind of became the container that we tried to, um, the space that we uh, tried to create in Durham. 
and I'll pick up from here because I'm sitting here looking uh, Associate Jackie. We had like a very brief interaction like the night of the film showing in David and yet I feel so connected. And I think that was really what we were trying to get at when we created uh, the focus group slash healing circle. Um, and I just remember being in that room and having some questions, but really trying to remind people about safety and space. And when you talk about a panel, uh, why we were so different is that one is that one way kind of information, but also you've experienced something that just has you roiled inside. And then you're expected to just stop and go into your headspace. And we knew that wasn't going to be a helpful way to get good understanding about what people needed and ongoing support. So when we gathered in the room, I think the most powerful thing that I remember, and David and Lisa would probably say the same thing, is we're about to get started. And one of our elders that was in the room just said, can we just stop and weep? And there was that moment where everybody just gave the space. There wasn't the rush. There was the knowing that there needed to be a place to be where you were at and to offer. And I think that was one of the connecting things mm -hmm. is that something about the way we set it up, said it was okay, but that also people had been so ready for a space and to watch something like Always in Season by yourself, which was I watched it the first time, not to be recommended. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you need somebody, you need somebody because it's a community experience. And so to then create this very intimate space that was not extractive that said we're here to talk about what this meant to you and and hopefully with you know good doctor films help us create more meaning mm -hmm. and so being able to hear what people were feeling uh, we saw in the end people talking about the ways they wanted to move forward with it um and it just was um seriously one of the most uh, amazing i've done a lot of facilitations a lot of different people but there was something about the way to come into a new community and be respectful and loving, loving in that community, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then get back a lot of openness. And I think that's why you got the information that you got back, uh, David, was that there was that space that was created. Mm -hmm. One other thing I'll just add, and then Sherry and others feel free to chime in. I remember um, David was both having to wear the research hat and then also uh, was we were do, working together on it in real time. And I remember looking at him and saying, we might get to one question. Yeah. And, and so that ability to kind of let go, because we probably spent 40 minutes on group introductions. Yeah. And I put introductions in a big stand because every single person had a connection to the story that they wanted mm -hmm. to share. People that for the first time, again, breaking the silence, people that for the first time that were saying, we put those stories away. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about those stories or thank you for giving us the space or white folks who were like, holy s, sorry, I cuss. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I can't believe this is happening in my backyard. Yeah. And so giving people, Sherry, turn it back to you, giving people that space, expansive space to just say what they needed to, Absolutely. not to be rigid. Absolutely. Let me, let me tie a few things here and thank you both for your extraordinary work. Um, Radical Optimist is doing across the nation to really give breath and space to conversations that we've learned from this study are actually really key to community building. And again, I can't emphasize enough, this is an evidence-based study. And for those who are in the world of, and I think for filmmakers who are asking the question, you know, how do I actually have impact work with my film? You know, this study is giving us a little bit of a roadmap beyond what we've all known, which is that panels like us, you know, getting folks together who are experts, but nonetheless, giving more breath and space to who these audience members are is really what, where the transformational um, value of the screening is at. And so let me um, just read a quick quote here, and then I want to go to some questions from our audience and comments. This is a quote from a mother who participated in the Twin Falls um, screening, and we'll call them a healing circle. We can call it a focus group. And I want to say a little more about language in a minute. We'll pivot to that conversation. Here's what a mother um, of three had to say. As the mother of three white young men, I feel it's my responsibility to make sure that they witness information like this, that they are engaged in knowing the history behind it and that they go forward with that knowledge and try to build bridges and make sure 
that they are not part of that problem. Wow. Okay, so this is not what we hear typically, you know, if we're in a movie theater hanging out, we don't even, we're not even in movie theaters at the moment yet. In most places in the world, we've had a pandemic. It's a whole other piece of this whole virtual versus in-person. But what we're hearing today is the power of being together and the power of conversation to bring forth and elicit these kinds of deep commentaries about what the value of conversation is. And this mother of three clearly saw something for her children that she found to be somewhat revelatory. Um, okay, so I'd like to just make a point that you've been hearing about the work of Radical Optimists and Resource Guides and this study. They are being made available in the chat. And it is, I think, the greatest hope for all of us here on the panel that they are disseminated and read and shared widely. And as we move into more questions, I just want to um, I want to throw a question out there, but I also want to frame the impact of the study just by virtue of what we're doing at ITVS. Um, I was at the time of the study heading the IL pop-up program, Independent Lens pop-up program. Program. Um, we have, we're in, again, as I mentioned at the outset, in about 50 to 70 markets each season hosting free screenings. And many of those partners were able to participate in the study in one way or another. Post this study, my entire work pivoted, it was going in this direction anyway, but pivoted to the exploration of impact innovation. We have since, thanks to um, willing filmmakers like Jacqueline Olive, we've hosted a hackathon for humanity where we began to explore design thinking in the building of communities. We're actually investing in the work of the Guild of Future Architects. And we're actually investing as well in something called DocScale, which is a new measurement tool for actually measuring the social impact of films. And much more can be said about that, but I wanna to go to a pivotal question that has come up and that is, Let's talk a little bit about language. And um, Jackie, I'm gonna move to you for a moment um, more. Um, in the making of Always in Season and in the presentation of Always in Season, can you talk a little bit about language? What is the power of our words and how can we as the public and as filmmakers relate to the language we're using around racial justice and violence? Language is really critical. It's especially critical on a subject. Um, when you know, I began uh, researching the project, it was a subject that was uh, talked about very rarely in the mainstream. It was coming off of in 2008, coming off of this notion that we were in a post-racial society. Um, and so there was very little conversation in the mainstream about lynching and about racial violence in general. Um, and so when that is going on, there are, you, you all uh, mentioned very beautifully, Lisa and Vanessa about the need to hold space and give people an opportunity to process their um, their emotions, and you know, I, as as I was making the film over years, I saw them and 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 was identifying them um, as as I screened the film, and I, I actually did community engagement screenings, different versions, different cuts before I finished the film for about four years prior. Um, always with the focus, I they, they I conceived of the idea with the focus that this is the kind of film that could open up the conversation and the dialogues that are needed to have about racial violence, um, in particular about lynching, but other forms of racial violence as well. And so um, one of the things that I could see is that people had limited language about talking about these issues. And so it was really important to not just hold space around the emotions, but also to, to reframe the conversation in a way that's productive. And so it's that I, I, was, I always found myself balancing that line between um, framing the conversation in a way that doesn't fall into the same um, kind of uh, um, uh, scenarios and the same going down the same rabbit holes that are have, have been traditionally unproductive um, to talking about um, this subject in a way that people can start to open up and can start to look at it in a new way. So I was really excited. The um, Hackathon for Humanity that um, ITVS put on in Atlanta in, I believe it was 2019, Sherry, or 20, yeah, 2019. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was it was this really great opportunity to explore language in many ways. And so um, one is what do you how do you refer to um, impact and engagement? Is that the best way to talk about um, the ways that you are um, interacting with communities? And, and so the language originally when I came into the film industry was about out, outreach and then it moved um, to um, in, uh, engagement and then in audience engagement and then it moved to impact. And so all of these questions around um, uh, a subject which is really highly complicated, I think really deserves a deep dive, um, look into um, uh, things that can be as subtle as how are we talking about violence and how are we talking about race? 
Thank you, Jackie. I'm, you know, I want to, um, there is a question in the chat and that's incredibly powerful what you're saying and for our filmmakers out there and for aspiring filmmakers and for audiences, for any of us, um, this whole idea of how we're speaking forth, um, you know, how we use language is really critical, something for us all to be thinking about all the time. Um, here's a question to David or anyone on the panel. Um, how did the conversations in different cities differ? Were there vastly different reactions to the film in different cities? And noting that there were red states, blue states, we were really going for a variety of people. Um, what did you see out there, David? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, well, the settings definitely differed um, in, a, in a spatial way to start, I guess. So they, we held them um, in different community spaces. So one was in a, a public library, for instance, um, one was in a, a Denny's, in the back room of a Denny's. Um, another was in a historically segregated theater um, in Bristol. Another one was in a university uh, campus room um, or building room. Um, another one was at a public TV station. Um, and another was another community theater. So the, the spaces kind of differed. Um, and in some ways, in, but that was by design also. Um, but I'd say the, the conversations were, were, were were very similar across. I think a lot of people brought the same, um, people shared bringing the same kind of fears to the conversation too. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, we had multiple participants of color say that they were afraid that going to this documentary and going to this conversation was gonna lead to people saying things like, um, this is a problem over there, but it's not a problem here. Um, and that was, you know, in, in Concord, New Hampshire, and that was in, um, and where did we go? Um, in Idaho, in, um, in Bristol, and, and everywhere. Um, and there was also similar, uh, similar reservations on the, the, on the half of uh, station managers and other people who were kind of nervous about starting a community conversation around um, racial violence. Um, and people admitting that there was a lot of hesitation to doing the, you know, doing the conversations in the first place. And a lot of participants coming out of it with, though, with the same, um, you know, very similar um, experiences, though, in the end. So very similar takeaways and, and people, the fact that people trusted it in different communities, the fact that um, we had people who, um, as Lisa and Vanessa were saying, had, were sharing things for the first time and saying that they, you know, that they had, they hadn't had an opportunity to, to share an experience um, that either happened to themselves or to a family member um, in a public space before. And so these, some of these are decades old experiences. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say that the, the settings differed, um, but the, the experiences were, were kind of shockingly similar. Um, and so I, that's mostly where, you know, our, the report kind of focuses on trying to pull out where those similarities are, I think. Yeah. Well, David, thank you for that. I mean, um, I think one of our audience members has summed it up. I'm um, Beth, Thank you, Beth Lambden, saying what she's hearing is how critical it is to create space and to meet people where they are and to minimize the experts and rely on the wisdom that, that the group has assembled. And I, I think we're all shaking our heads yes to that. This is critical information and it really means that communities have the potential to solve their own problems and that these documentaries can really be essential to building that conversation in a trusted environment is another underlying thought here. And I just wanna open that up a little bit to our panel, but also to our audience. I know that this, um, you, that Always in Season uh, was on Independent Lens on PBS, and we do have other statistics that do point to public television still being one of the most trusted entities that we have in society. And I'm just curious, again, if we can all look together at what is a safe space? And let's be real, you know, we've had a reckoning. Look at the country at this moment in time. And I really want to, you know, go there, right? This is a place where people could be terrified of opening their mouths or people are just so divisive. They're in their own echo chambers. You know, who, how are we getting people into these places? And how has PBS maintained this trust in this space? But how can we do, have more of what it is that PBS stands for, public media stands for, which are trusted environments that are actually media environments as well. And maybe over to you, Lisa and Vanessa, and again, our audience, I don't know who's out there, but we'd love your thoughts on this as well. What, one of the things in radical options that we talk about, especially when we started out in Montgomery is my concept is safe enough space. I don't believe there's anything called safe space. And so it's, so when we talk about, it's about some intentionality, it can't be controlled. You can't 
protect everybody, but there is a shared commitment to everybody in that room with the facilitators sort of guiding in a little bit to say, we are here to do hard work mm -hmm. and we all have a truth and that we all have a responsibility to create um, some safe enough space. And so there will be some risk-taking. Lisa, one of the least, my favorite thing that Lisa always says is we have to sometimes move at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it means that there are incomplete conversations and reminding people, this is a beginning. We're like, we're breaking a silence um, and to experience both the emotional release of that, but also that we're learning how to step into very uh, oftentimes painful conversations. But at the other side of that is the incredible intimacy mm -hmm. and the recognition of seeing ourselves in the story. And, and Jackie, I just need to say, you created such a powerful film that doesn't completely overwhelm. And so it opens up to feel all this, but it, it still, still leaves space for people to engage and see themselves and be open to hearing how other people see them. And I think that that was an art that you did there because I think it was very hard given the subject matter and it makes it easier to step into those conversations. One other thing I'd add, cause someone, um, so my best friend is a documentary filmmaker uh, and I have, have feel like I'm maybe here in the family just listening to her and witnessing her process for so many years. But to this point around like, Beth, who said in the in the chat around resources for facilitation, um, is this is another opportunity to kind of put down titles. There are so many people in your community, therapists, social workers, the woman next door who's been doing it at church for the last 50 years that know intuitively, that have a gift of how to create and hold those spaces. And so again, I think the other part is kind of dropping the event mindset and lifting up that mindset of, of community and really looking, looking around at the resources that oftentimes are right, literally right under your mm -hmm. nose. And to begin to the point of um, people, you know, at the end of these uh, conversations really wanted to keep going. Yeah, we were like, okay, there's Jason and Sarah and, you know, someone else who would be like, well, I'll get, let's meet up at the coffee shop next Tuesday who are just willing to keep going because it hasn't been an expert facilitator that has to be the one that's, um, you know, donned with the, with that. So really looking at those community resources you have. Absolutely. I'll just add one more thing is that the, you know, when the experts leave and they fly back to whatever city um, they came from is that the community is still there and they're left with um, issues to tackle. And so in order to um, uh, start to build coalitions to where these conversations can move even further to additional action, I think it's really important to engage people right where they are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I'd like to um, just, I know for filmmakers out there who are in a position where they're wondering, okay, this is, sounds great. And I'm having enough to do just raising money to get my film finished. <laughs> I'm having enough to do just trying to get the next interview and build that trust in the community to get what I need done. Um, what is the reality um, around funding for impact? And I wanna, you know, also again, just kind of jingle our audience and just ask, you know, um, there are foundations, there are lots of places that are beginning, I think to on the heels, not only of this study, and I know that this study has actually sparked for ITVS, interest in raising um, funds and building partnerships around impact, which is really extraordinary. We're an organization that just saw firsthand through this work that there actually, we could move the needle potentially on things like um, justice and mass incarceration. And it could be, and again, I say could be, that over time, building these kinds of conversations um, really could shift something. So to that end, um, I just wanna throw it out there, how viable for filmmakers um, in our audience, now I'm asking questions of you, is it that impact work is even possible? Um, we know that it takes a great deal. And so the study is encouraging in terms of results, and then it's really about building um, systems and structures to be able to support that. So just shout out to the audience if you have any thoughts on that. And um, also Katie, while the audience is thinking, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Um, just on a personal note as well, heading the Center for Media and Social Impact, I know that you're involved in a number of studies ongoingly, and I'm really just looking at what do you see um, maybe as a bellwether 
you know, for what's coming in the area of engagement and impact. Um, an area I know you have a background in is comedy um, and social change. And there's a number of ways. Um, I have a background in music and social change. What else is possible in these environments other than conversation? What can we look toward? Sherry, uh, I'll say to the audience that I've been in several facilitated conversations with Sherry Simpson, and she's always amazing to me. Just such a great facilitator bringing people in. Um, thank you for that. I'll just maybe take this moment to say broadly, maybe I'll be provocative because everyone likes that at a film festival. There's not enough funding to do this work meaningfully. So that's just uh, a big headline. There's not nearly enough funding to do the kinds of grassroots engagement in physical spaces that require holding space, as we've said over and over again, which is not the same thing as people talking at you. Um, to do that well requires a lot of investment in every single community. It requires humans working together, you know, all of that. So, um, but we've seen, you know, through the power of not to get political, but the power of grassroots organizing in this country, largely by women of color, is the reason that um, the election changed, right? So physical gathering matters a great deal when we think about social progress. And I guess I'll use my time to say that maybe the other thing, I don't know if that was provocative or not, I give you all a big tease, um, which is that, uh, I think we still have a long way to go when it comes to honoring creativity and culture in real social progress work. Because I don't mean talking points that are served up to target audiences. Sometimes that's what we think of when we think about social change work. It's very clinical and this audience will respond to this message. That is not how social change works. We really should know better by now. Um, but really honoring creativity and culture, including things like, as Sherry knows, and Sherry has a shared interest, we have a large body of work in comedy and social change. We think that also matters for documentary. Um, it, because of the role of this sort of wild open creativity and the way that artists, their job, documentary people, comedy people, musicians, their job is to see the world differently and to serve it back in a different way. But I think that we often think of artists, and I mean this really broadly, comedy people, filmmakers, as people to just throw some money at, but then hope to kind of contain them in a space that feels safe for us. Safety and creativity is not what leads to social change. So I, I'll just uh, you know, step down off my soapbox by saying to an audience that I think probably feels similarly. Um, when we have opportunities to work with true storytellers, entertainers, creative culture makers, we must honor their creative process and leave it in their hands and trust the contributions that, that, that they're going to make that are going to be different from those of us making other kinds of contributions. So I actually think we still have kind of a ways to go on that, but that's an opportunity. I'll leave that on an optimistic note. Absolutely. And in the um, one minute and 20 seconds that we have left, and I just I want, want to thank everyone. Katie, thank you for that. Very, very powerful. Um, I'm going to give a last word to our creative uh, artists who joined us from which uh, you know, all of this has emanated. Um, Jacqueline Olive, over to you for last words, and then we'll toss it back to Ken. Thanks, thank Sherry. I, I want to just acknowledge what a rare opportunity to be part of this study. Um, um, it's been um, and how much I appreciate the rigor and the care with which everyone, ITVS and, and Radical Optimists and CS, C, CMSI really put into um, uh, looking at the impact of, of the film. And, um, and to say that there was a question about, well, I don't have ITVS funding, so how can I, what can I do around impact and engagement? How is this study helpful? And I just wanna say that I, um, I started doing impact around the film um, before the study and, and, have, um, and we have impact and engagement partners, the Logan uh, Family Foundation, uh, Jonathan Logan Family Foundation and um, the Perspective Fund um, and also um, Bay Area Video Coalition are, are some of our impact and engagement partners. But I also had funders who really emphasized impact and engagement um, and, and organizations that support it. So there was, there's the Doc Society Impact Field Guide, which is an uh, incredible resource 
Firelight Media and Sonia Childress were really instrumental in helping me to understand um, audience and understand how do I bring the film to audience um, in a way that's most effective. Um, and so there's plenty that you can do along the way um, before you have funds. There's plenty that I did along the way that I, before I had funds. And you can also decide how much you want to invest um, in community engagement and so that you don't feel like it's a burden. You do it out of the sense of what it is that you want to do with the film that's really useful out of that passion that you have. And, and, and that's different for different people, um, but that there is uh, plenty to do um, to get the film out. And there are plenty of ways to do it with funding partners um, um, and plenty of resources. And then when in those lean times, there, there's still um, uh, other ways to look on a very local level um, at how you can make your work really useful for the audiences that you're making your films for. Thank you so much, everyone. Jacqueline, um, Katie, David, Lisa, Vanessa. Um, and now really, and everyone who's been listening over to you, Ken. And again, thank you all for joining us. We look forward to any further conversations beyond our little boxes. Thank you. Over to you, Ken. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Sherry. And thanks everybody. And as uh, Jackie just said, there's, there's plenty to do and plenty of ways to do it. So we encourage all of you out there to start doing it or to continue doing it. Um, I wanted to also just thank our two ASL interpreters, Shannon Rickert and Jill Kenahan. Thank you so much. And I wanted to mention tomorrow's forum events. We have two sessions tomorrow, Getting Serious About Series, New Collaborations Between Public Media Series and Indie Filmmakers. That's happening at 2 p.m. Eastern. And Looking to the Future with Hindsight, which is a focus on the Hindsight Project, speaking of collaborations. And that is happening at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. We'd also love to hear from you all on social media at hashtag AFI Docs. And please join us for great films and virtual events at docs.afi.com. Thanks again to all of our panelists, to Sherry, our audience. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>